So the first, the first group, uh, as I was saying, is the susceptible ones and represents the people uh, who are healthy and can contract the disease. The exposed ones are the ones that are infected but not infectious, not yet infectious. Uh, the infected group represents the people that um, have, been, have been confirmed to uh, be infected. And the recovered ones are, are the, the group which represents uh, the, the, the people who have been recovered from the disease and cannot contract it again. Uh, so um, now the parameters, the, the parameter lambda uh, is a new add to the susceptible population. Uh, the parameter beta represents the contact transmission between the, from the susceptible people to the exposed one. Uh, gamma uh, and uh, the, uh, gamma is a parameter who um, which express the uh, um, the uh, rate of confirmed infected from the exposed population to the infected population i. Delta is the transmission rate of recovery from the exposed to the, re the removed or uh, recovered population. And alpha is a rate of recovery from the infected population to the recovered ones. So taking into account this scheme, we can uh, mm, define uh, uh, the corresponding system of ordinary differential equations. Uh, we see it's composed uh, of... Um, for different uh, differential equations, which involves the four different subpopulations and the different parameters. Here we can see a new parameter, which is n, and represents the number of total population, and is defined as the sum uh, between uh, the, the four different uh, subpopulations. So now let's move to uh, the fake news, and let's see how can we adapt this system, this scheme uh, on the diffusion of fake news. So uh, in this case, we uh, have taken the population S, which are the susceptible one, as the number of internet users who are still not aware of the news up to time T. E, uh, uh, that e, I remind, was the exposed population. In this case, are the users who have been exposed to the item of fake news through the internet and have to decide to spread or not the news. I speaks for the spreader one, so the ones who have read the news, the fake news, and have decided to spread it, and R are the ones who have read the, the fake news and have decided uh, not to spread the, the not, not to diffuse the, the fake news. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the parameters are defined in the following way. So lambda is a new ad rate to the susceptible population. B is a contact rate at which susceptible population are aware of the news and becomes infected. Gamma is the rate at which people decide to spread the news. Delta is the rate at which agents decide not to spread the news. And alpha is uh, the time represents the time life of the fake news measuring days divided by the total number of days under investigation. So more in a, in a detailed way, Lambda stays for uh, the new internet subscriptions in, the, in, the, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this work. We have chosen it as the new internet subscriptions. Alpha X is fixed as 0 0.01 since we assume 10 days for the life of fake news and we study uh, 1,000 days to investigate the diffusion of the fake news. Beta and delta are um, chosen as the individuals using internet and the literacy rate, respectively, and gamma is, assume, is as an assumed value that we have taken be between 0 0.1 and 0 0.9 uh, in order to uh, also understand uh, uh, how how is the, uh, how mm, is the, the behavior of the subpopulations for different values of gamma? So in this table, uh, we have the values of the different parameters for five different countries. These values have been taken uh, from these uh, two uh, websites, with, which has which have uh, available data to uh, to work that facilitate. The, the study of this kind of models. 
Mm, and now uh, we will see how to solve our uh, system of ordinary differential equations uh, from the mathematical point of view in order to see the behavior of the subpopulations for the diffusion of fake news. So what we do is to consider an initial value vector. We linearize our model obtaining this expression of the uh, ODE system and then we compute the Jacobian matrix associated to the linear part of the linear uh, of the linearization of our model. So uh, here uh, in, on the top, we have the, uh, the expression of the Jacobian matrix, uh, which depends on the parameters and of the population. And then once we get our Jacobian matrix, what we do is to um, is to compute the stiffness ratio of the differential equation system. So uh, this stiffness ratio uh, is, uh, is um, defined as the ratio between the largest and the smallest uh, eigenvalue of the Jacobian matrix in, value, um, in absolute value. And the idea is to uh, relate in some way the value of the, sti of the stiffness ratio of the ODE system uh, with uh, the behavior of the subpopulation. So we want to relate the stiffness, the stiffness ratio with uh, the velocity of the diffusion of fake news. And this is uh, an, an idea which was developed in this work here by Raffaele D'Ambrosio, Giuseppe Giordano, Serena Motola, Beatrice Paternoster, applied, a very, uh, um, applied to a very classical model, uh, which is the SEER-1. So uh, what we want to do here is to apply uh, this idea to a SEIR model. Uh, to do this, uh, we consider a different initial data vector for each investigated country. We have taken a zero as uh, the percentual of the population. Sorry. Ah, okay, I, th I thought there was a problem. Uh, a zero is obtained as uh, the percentual of population which has access to internet and is uh, an available data uh, on the websites that I mentioned it, uh, before. And then the values of is zero, I zero, and R zero have been assumed in order to uh, give a sense on the on the initial subpopulations. Uh, here we have reported the different uh, stiff values for the stiffness ratio uh, for each um, for each uh, uh, country, and we can see that uh, the uh, biggest stiffness ratio corresponds to uh, Portugal, and the less and the smallest uh, stiffness ratio corresponds to Thailand. So now, with some numerical uh, experiments, we will see how to relate these values uh, to uh, the diffusion of the news. Uh, and here we have the same, uh, the first, sorry, the first numerical example in which uh, on the bottom we have uh, on, on the left uh, the behavior of, uh, of the uh, different subpopulations and on the right we have uh, the behavior of the stiffness ratio on time. Uh, and uh, on, the, on the top, we have these results uh, corresponding to Morocco. And on the bottom, we have the results corresponding to Guatemala. And we can see uh, from the left uh, uh, plot that the stiffness ratio for Guatemala is uh, bigger with respect to the one uh, for Morocco. And on the right, we can see that the uh, number of infected population and uh, the, the behavior of the infected one is uh, bigger, the number of infected population is bigger when the stiffness ratio is bigger, and the diffusion, so the behavior of the, of the infected population uh, is, um, uh, happens before with respect to the, uh, to the Morocco situation. So uh, we can see, we can say, we can affirm from these uh, numerical examples that uh, the biggest uh, the time uh, the the stiffness ratio is uh, the biggest uh, is the number of uh, infected population and the diffusion of fake news happens uh, before on time with respect to uh, 
to, to, to Morocco in this case, which has a, a smaller stiffness ratio. The same happens in these cases. On the bottom row, we have the results for Argentina, and on the bottom row, we have the results for Thailand. Uh, and again, if we, if we see the stiffness, the behavior of the stiffness ratio for both of the countries, uh, we can see that that is smaller for uh, the Thailand case. Uh, and uh, it verifies that the infected number of people is smaller with respect to the Argentina case. And also the diffusion of the fake news seems to be um, uh, slower on time with respect to the one uh, corresponding to, to Argentina. Uh, here we have a comparison between uh, the behavior of the subpopulations uh, uh, for the SEER model studied in the paper that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, so in the, bot in the top row we have the comparison between the, the, the populations for the SEER and the SEER model for Morocco and, and in the bottom uh, we have the results for Guatemala. And we can see uh, <coughs> sorry, and we can see uh, that the, the the behavior in general of the subpopulations are similar, uh, but uh, for the infected uh, populations, uh, the number uh, of infected people is small smallest. Uh, here we can see it better. Uh, we is smaller in the same model because the exposed. Um, the exposed subpopulation uh, is divided between, uh, if we remind the scheme, is divided between the infected population and the removed population. So uh, the number of infected people on the same model uh, is, uh, is smaller with respect to the same model, which makes sense because uh, uh, the, the, the subpopulation of exposed people uh, is divided into, into groups. So this uh, are the main uh, uh, results which have uh, been uh, we we have obtained uh, in this research and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Patricia. Any questions? Do you have any questions? No? Okay. The next one is. Um. Angela Maria Cardone and Gianluca Cascaccia. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Okay, hi, hi. sorry. Okay. okay, let me one, one moment share my okay, screen. And one moment I have to modify my... Okay, sorry. Okay, and uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you to everyone for participating to this session and thank you to the organizers for letting me uh, participate to this uh, conference. Uh, I'm Angela Maria Cardone and uh, I'm from the uh, University of Salerno. I will present a joint work with, um, uh, with uh, uh, Professor Frascagaccia from the University of Salerno. And uh, I will uh, speak about the solution of time fractional diffusion models. And uh, this is a brief outline of my presentation. After an introduction to the problem, I will uh, present, um, I will focus on reaction fractional reaction diffusion systems. And uh, I will uh, speak about the problem. And then uh, I will deal with the numerical solution by a mixed method. And finally, I will uh, illustrate the performances of the method of some, on some numerical experiments. And finally, I will draw some conclusion and, um, and uh, propose some uh, further development of this research. So uh, what we consider is fractional differential equations, which are uh, differential equations where the derivative index alpha 
uh, is, of a, is not a non-integer one. As you see, we will um, adopt the Caputo definition of fractional derivative because there are several definitions of uh, uh, fractional derivative. This is the most used in the applications because it needs, as you see, uh, integer order um, derivatives as uh, initial values with, which have a physical meaning and so can, can be measured. As you see from the definition of fractional derivative, it depends on the past history of the solution. For this reason, uh, fractional differential equations are suitable to describe phenomena with memory, and they are able to, um, to model uh, all the problems where the memory, where the past has influence in the present. And so um, there, here we have some applications like the behavior of the scholastic materials or anomalous diffusion in transport dynamics and many other models. And uh, because of the, the, wide, the widespread of these models, a great effort has been, um, has been done by in the, in the last years to develop efficient numerical methods. Many of them come as uh, arise as an extension, a suitable extension of numerical methods for ODEs. And, um, and, this uh, and so many of them are separate step methods. They are easy to implement and to analyze, but on the other side, when applied to fractional differential models, they uh, exhibit a low order of convergence, uh, usually not exceeding two, and they have a non computational cost because at each time step, we have to discretize the, uh, his the history term coming from the hereditary nature of fractional differential equations. Therefore, this is, um, these problems come from the fact that step-by-step -step methods represent an inherent local approach, which is uh, more adapt to, um, to discretize ordinary differential equations, which are a local model, while fractional differential equations are a global model, global operator, because uh, of the dependence on the past. And, for, and be, because of this, some global approaches have been proposed in the last years, and in particular, spectral methods. Uh, several classes of spectral methods have been proposed so far, and in particular, we focus on spectral collocation methods. Um, but, uh, but now let's focus on the problem that we considered, that is a fractional reaction diffusion system of this type. Here we consider uh, a linear diffusion case, and uh, we, uh, we consider some um, some boundary, uh, boundary conditions like uh, Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions. Here there is a, uh, sorry, a mistake because when alpha it is between zero and one, we need only the initial value of the solution at, at, the, at the time zero. But when alpha is between one and two, we need also to, to, um, to give the initial value of the derivative of the solution at time zero. What we propose what to, to uh, obtain an accurate solution, but at a reasonable computational cost, is to consider a, um, a method which is composed to by a finite difference schemal of space, uh, which is enough accurate and easy to implement, with a spectral method a long time, on a suitable basis of function. So, by, by using this spectral method, we avoid the step-by-step -step methods, avoid to, in, to, to discretize at each time step the, the history term. And moreover, for a suitable choice of the basis of the fitting space, they have exponential convergence. But let's, uh, let's start from the spatial discretization, because I remember we have a double discretization to perform here uh, over, over space and over time. Over space, we consider a centered uh, finite difference scheme where the coefficients a1 and a2 and a0 
can be chosen as the, class the classical ones, that is 1 and minus 2, but in the case of oscillatory problems along space, we can, we can use uh, we can um, use some uh, exponentially fitted coefficients, that is coefficients that are coefficients depending on an estimate of the frequency of the, uh, of the problem, of the solution. And so once uh, we um, discretize the, uh, the space, the, the equation along space, we come to a, 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 um, a system of fractional, the fractional uh, differential equations where the matrix L is a tridiagonal tri matrix with the entries A0, A1 and A2. So how to solve now this system, which can be quite large because M could be can be large because it is the number of space, space, uh, space um, points. We approximate the uh, solution, each component of the solution, as a linear combination of some functions, pj, which are uh, chosen in advance in such a way that the, that the, the, their derivative, uh, fractional derivative is known and it is easy to compute. And moreover, it is, uh, we need that pj should be um, specially tuned on the problem. And so how to compute those coefficients to J? We have to, uh, we um, introduce a set of collocation points on the time interval. And then we express the approximate solution UN as a linear combination of uh, the values of the approximate solution at the collocation point. And so now there is the introduction of these functions Vj, which are not known, but we will compute them in a moment. Uh, of course, the fractional uh, derivative of un can be computed in this way in terms of the uh, fractional derivatives of these functions Vj. And so once we, we replace those guys in, the, uh, in this nonlinear, in, in this system, and we, uh, we ask that this uh, equation hold for uh, at the collocation point Tj, we come to a set of, uh, of a set of equations which can be in more compact form can be written in this way. Uh, but let's go back. Uh, so we have on the left hand side the uh, unknowns Uij. And on the right hand side, um, the discretization along space. And now, but now the system cannot be uh, solved because we need to compute those guys, those Vj at Tk. We do not know those guys Vj, but uh, what do not, we do not need to know uh, the, their analytical expression, but only their values at the collocation points. And this can be done quite easily thanks to this theorem, because we can compute those values which uh, form the matrix D and the vector D. Here, okay, we have the vector D, it is phi zero at the collocation point. Matrix D is the uh, value, are the values of phi j at the collocation points. And we can, we can compute those vector, this vector and matrix by this theorem in terms of the values of the function pj, which are known, and of the, uh, their derivatives at the collocation points. So now everything is known, and so we can write this Sylvester equation, and uh, the unknown now, it is only the, uh, the matrix U of the values, of, of the approximate values of the solution at the points x, i, and tj. This is a, uh, a, non -linear, a Sylvester nonlinear equation when f is nonlinear. And uh, matrix M is a tridiagonal matrix. And so now, um, and now how to, uh, which are the uh, ingredients which are necessary to obtain convergence and 
uh, fast convergence of the method. The key is the, a good choice of the uh, functions pj, should they should be um, suitable, they should be adapted to the problem, and moreover, also the collocation points could be, should be uh, suitably chosen. For example, as a spectral basis, we considered a class, three classes of, of uh, spectral basis. The power basis, one, t to the power alpha, t to the power two alpha, and so on. This power basis is uh, used in this context because it is the base, it, the base of uh, solutions of the basic linear test equation for the fractional, the fractional problems, that is, the alpha of y equal to lambda times y. That is the analog, the fractional ana analog of the uh, basic linear test equation for ODs. The set of Jacobi polynomials depending on alpha, they uh, have, uh, uh, they rise as um, the basis of solution of this fractional strong problem. And finally, the trigonometric basis. For collocation points, we consider the three classes of points, equidistant and Chebyshev roots or extreme. And now, uh, and now, and um, and we uh, and we also uh, this approach uh, is uh, valid when alpha is, is between zero and one. But when alpha is uh, uh, is between one and two or uh, any other uh, non-integer order. We have to modify this approach and we suitably introduce um, introduce new uh, the new um, initial values depending on the on the uh, derivatives of the solution at the initial point. And so the method is a little bit more complicated, but still the formulation is um, is still more or less the same. And once, what's more, we also considered a nonlinear diffusion term as uh, a more generalization of the problem. And so we come to this uh, Sylvester equation. In this case, uh, the unknown is still U. And finally, I will come to some uh, numerical experiments. Uh, first, we start from a, um, a linear diffusion problem. In this case, we know the analytical solution. It is in, in a serious form. Therefore, we truncate this, this, this sum to uh, compute the solution, the reference solution. And we uh, and here there is a, there are two plots of the numerical solution. On the left, with, when uh, um, we consider the, the case of alpha equal to 0 0.5, on the right of alpha equal to 1.5. We considered as basis of functions the Jacobi polynomials because it uh, they have um, it proved to have the fastest error degree decrease and as collocation points the Chebyshev zeros. And here uh, this is uh, here we uh, we see we observe the um, the decrease of the error with respect to, to uh, with respect to n where n i remind you it is the number of function of fitting um, of, of the basis of functions pj and so we observe that in all cases uh, here we vary alpha in all cases, we observe an exponential convergence. I also have to say that here we have uh, we have used a logarithmic scale along uh, y-axis. Okay, in the various cases we have different uh, different rates of convergence, but in any case we observe exponential convergence. And and now finally one example, no linear example. In this case. The nonlinear diffusion example k is equal to the square root of u. Here we have to uh, example to um, the numerical solution on the left when alpha is equal to 0 0.5, on the right when alpha is equal 1.5. And still in this case we observe exponential convergence. Here we couldn't uh, we have the, to compute the, the error as 
with respect to a reference solution which was computed with a larger number of uh, collocation of um, of of uh, n larger value of n um, and now uh, we come to some to draw from some conclusion we observed that uh, we, we introduced the new mixed method and we also um, we also generalized this approach when uh, alpha is between 1 and 2, that is, we consider a super diffusion case. It has a reduced computational cost with respect to step-by-step -step methods and for a suitably chosen basis of functions, it, uh, it uh, has exponential convergence. As further de developments, we are working on numerical methods which preserve conservation rules for fractional PDEs, and we consider the, this class of uh, methods in particular. And moreover, we are considering the, to implement in parallel this method because even if it has a reasonable, reasonable uh, computational cost with respect to step-by-step -step methods, since it comes from a semi-discretization of a, a fractional PDEs, it is it is as still a large dimension. So thank you for your attention and bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any question? No. We have to... okay. okay. Then it's... thank you. Please is Antonio Bocuto Ivan. Gerazze and Valentina Giorgetti. Yes, yes, I am Ivan Gerazze. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am going to present to you a, uh, a paper about uh, a fast discrete transform for a class of simultaneous diagonalizable matrices. Uh, first of all, let's present this class. To present this class, we have to uh, present you the matrix QN that is uh, composed by uh, n column, this uh, n column Q0, Q, n minus 1. And uh, the first half, so that the one between zero and uh, n uh, over two are composed by a cosine function, while the last one are composed by the sinus function. And uh, we will call uh, the first vector, the one with the cosine function as uh, uj multiplied a constant. And the one with sinus uh, function we call uh, Vj with uh, multiply a constant. The, um, we call uh, and now consider uh, sorry. Uh, it's important to say that this matrix is an, an orthogonal matrix. Then uh, let's consider a vector uh, of dimension n uh, whose elements are lambda zero lambda n minus one. We say that this vector is symmetric if uh, lambda j is equal to lambda n minus uh, j. And we call, we say that it's asymmetric if lambda uh, j is equal to uh, minus uh, lambda n minus n. So uh, we uh, refer as GN, the class of the matrix that are simultaneous, diagonalizable, with the matrix Q. Uh, moreover, we define as CN, a subclass of this matrix, that, uh, that has the property that the vector of the Akin value is symmetric. Uh, another subclass of this, this uh, uh, class is BN, that has the property that the uh, Akin value of the, 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 the matrix are asymmetric. It's possible to prove that the CN corresponds to, uh, to the set of all sequent sy symmetric sequent uh, matrix, while uh, BN is a, is a subclass of the set of reverse sequent matrix. 
uh, it's possible to prove that uh, Gn is the direct sum of these two classes, uh, and we will call uh, a, a matrix uh, gamma matrix if, if, if this matrix belongs to the class C Gn. Uh, this is an important class, as we prove by this theorem, that uh, uh, by this uh, class is possible to precondition uh, um, uh, the symmetric uh, tablet system that, that are very common in, in, uh, in the lectures. So uh, in, this, in this talk, we, are, uh, the, uh, we present a technique to compute the multiplication of, of a uh, gamma matrix uh, G by a vector X. Since uh, we see before that G uh, is symmetric diagonalizable by uh, uh, um, QN, we can use the uh, spectral factorization and then uh, divide this multiplication in three steps. In the first one, we multiply QN transpose by X. The second one, we multiply, we multiply uh, lambda g uh, by z, and the, in the last one we multiply qn by t. Uh, so let's start with the multiplication of qn uh, transpose uh, x. We call this multiplication uh, inverse discrete sine cosine transform, and uh, from now on we refer as m the uh, n over 2. Uh, we refer as near as uh, n over 4, and n is a power of 2. Uh, this inverse uh, um, transform can be uh, performed in this way, where for the uh, first component we use a C function, and the, for the last component we use a S function. A C function is a scalar product of the uh, vector x uh, for, with the uh, U uh, vector, U, the U vector are the one with cosine psi. Uh, and in the, in, for the S function, we have a multiplication of the uh, a scalar product of X with the V vector. The V vector was the, the one that has sine psi. And uh, this uh, constant alpha are, are, are given by this formula. Then uh, we define the, for, the following function. Uh, the function eta uh, select the even component of a vector. The function zeta select the, uh, um, the old component of a vector. The function rho reverse a vector a part of the zero component of the vector, like, like that. So the function uh, sigma compute the uh, double of the symmetric part of the vector, while the function alpha compute the double of the asymmetric part of the vector, so that x uh, is given by sigma uh, x plus alpha x over 2. So it's possible to prove that our discrete transform can, can, can be computed like that, where now all the arguments of the G function are, are symmetric vector, and all the arguments of the S uh, function are asymmetric vector. So we prove this theorem. If X is a, a symmetric vector, uh, for K that goes from 1 to uh, N over 4 minus 1, uh, the function C can, can be computed by this formula. And if K goes to uh, n over 4 to n over 2 can be computed by the last formula. So uh, we propose to, by uh, using this formula to compute uh, our function by this function C, uh, CS, that is a recursive function you, that uses the formula that I showed before. And we proved that if we consider the value 1 over 2 cosine of 2 pi k over n as, as value stored in a library, uh, so the function cn has this computational cost in terms of addition and in terms of multiplication. And uh, the same uh, we, uh, we deal with the 
as function. So we prove a theorem that if x is a symmet symmetric uh, vector, then for k that goes from one uh, to um, n over, uh, over four minus one, we can compute s by this formula. If uh, k goes to from n over four plus one to n uh, over two uh, minus one, we can use this formula. Not there that the case, there is one case that uh, there is not uh, considered here. It's the case uh, k equal to n over four. Uh, so uh, we give a recursive algorithm to compute S that we call Sn. Notice there that uh, from the line 12 to the line 16, we compute the, uh, uh, the entry in the position n over 4. We have to compute with a lot of uh, computation because uh, our TM didn't deal with this case. So that uh, analysis, we prove that uh, if uh, the value 1 over 2 uh, cosine on 2 pi k over n are uh, stored in a library, Sn can be computed by uh, this number of uh, addition and this number of multiplication. So, uh, the other computation for the inverse transform are uh, order n. So uh, the sum of the two uh, values that I showed you before are the total cost, and the total cost is this one for the addition and for the uh, multiplication. In a similar case, uh, um, Trigo and Johnson give this, this one that is considered the best result that has this number of addition, this number of computation. Mm, they, they deal with another class, but it's more, very similar to our. We give this result. We, we have less multiplication that uh, are um, more cost, have more cost to um, be implemented, and uh, but more addition. The more addition are due to the fact that I that I say before that s uh, n over four is computed by the line that uh, goes between uh, uh, the 12 and the 16. And we have to improve this uh, uh, computation um, to, to find a way to compute this entry more, uh, more fast. Uh, then, uh, to compute the computation of uh, lambda uh, g uh, times zeta, we have to first the, uh, Compute the second value of g. But since g is uh, a matrix belonging to uh, gen, uh, g is given by uh, c plus b, where c is in uh, uh, gen and b is bn. And we can find these two matrix in, uh, in order uh, n. And we call as c bold the first line of c. B bold is the first line of B. Now uh, it's uh, possible to prove that the, we can compute separately the Aken value of C and the Aken value of B and sum them. Uh, and the Aken value of C, Aken value of B can be computed by these two, uh, this, this uh, scalar product, such that calling Sn uh, with the argument C, uh, SN, uh, S, sorry, S, uh, uh, GS, with the argument C and GS with the argument uh, B. For the other value, just uh, we have uh, to remember that the Aken value of C are symmetric and the Aken value of uh, B are as asymmetric. So the, uh, the, other, uh, um, the cost of the other operation is linear and the total cost of the uh, multiplication in the of, of lambda uh, times zeta is given by uh, this addition and this multiplication. Now, let's consider the last uh, multiplication, qn times uh, t, that we call this cosine cosine transform. For the first term, the term that goes between 0 and, and n over 2, uh, y uh, uh, j has this uh, value that 
here we have a sum in a cosine that goes to between zero and n minus two. Here we have a sum in, uh, with sine uh, that goes to one from one to uh, this is n over over two minus one. The same for the other the the the, 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 the other terms. Uh, uh, we have the same uh, sum. So we define the function, the function of uh, phi that uh, take uh, t and here they, they put t in the first part of this vector t bar and then they make this uh, this vector symmetric. Uh, the rest of the vector t are used for constructing t tilde, making the, the vector t tilde an asymmetric vector. Then it's possible to prove that uh, the, the first term of y can be computed uh, by this formula, where here we have uh, the function c app applied to t bar that is a symmetric vector and the function s applied to t tilde that is a symmetric vector. The same for the rest, uh, the, 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 the final terms. Here we have the same computation as before. So, Mm, uh, we we have just to call uh, C, uh, Gs on the vector T bar, uh, Sn on the vector T tilde, and the other, uh, the other computational linear. Uh, then the cost of this uh, uh, key transform is similar to the one uh, that um, the one the inverse uh, discrete sine cosine transform. Uh, so the total cost of computing uh, the multiplication of Gn and, uh, and X is given by uh, uh, five uh, multiplying n log uh, two of n plus uh, something uh, of a less order and uh, of addition and uh, two over uh, n, uh, three over two and uh, multiply log two. Uh, of n plus uh, a small o of uh, or, or n log n. Then, for conclusion, we uh, we propose a fast, very, uh, a very fast uh, discrete transform that uh, can be used for uh, the uh, gamma matrices that are very useful to preconditioning uh, symmetric type system. And, but now we have to try to reduce the computational cost of working on the term S uh, n over 4 uh, to obtain even more performing result. I finish my talk. Thank you very much. Any question? So the next one is here. So I share this presentation. Go. Can you see the presentation? Hello? Yes, yes. Thank you. Stop. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Sultan Lamri. I'm from uh, SAU Saudi Arabia, Saudi Electric University. And uh, today we'll, uh, we'll talk about anonymous trajectory method for indoor users for privacy protection. The, uh, the outline for this talk will be divided into, uh, first we'll talk uh, briefly about the uh, related work, then the motivation of this, and then uh, clocking cell algorithm, which is the, result, the, the, the proposed algorithm. And then we'll talk about the result evaluation, and then we'll end with the conclusion. First, um, uh, lots of work has been done in, in terms of privacy for uh, location for, indoor, for, uh, for outdoor users. So um, 
the, the spatial clocking uh, is being used for many years now, where basically the basic idea of it is uh, you don't show the exact location of of the uh, of the user. It will be clocked as a, as a larger area, and um, so you can determine the exact location of a certain user by creating a larger area of location where the user location exactly will not be seen. Uh, also mixed zone, which is one of the uh, also common ideas where they mix a few areas or they call zones in order to to make the uh, the exact location of a certain users. Uh, and and there's a, quite a lot of other uh, techniques for the outdoor spaces. However, it has not it has not been used uh, before in indoor space because um, I think the majority of users think uh, that the outdoor is the most concerned things. But nowadays, with the even with the pandemic and everything else, we spend lots of time in indoor spaces. Indoor is getting larger, and there is some places in indoor people does not want to be um, or they want to uh, protect their privacy in order to um, to not be uh, recognized in that in a certain area inside uh, buildings. For example, if a user A want to go to um, a destination, for example, uh, C80, in the way going to that certain cell, maybe he want to visit a certain room, C22, for example, and he doesn't want people to know he was in that room, for example. And this is the whole uh, idea here for this uh, paper. It's, it's adopt the ideas of clocking in outdoor space with the uh, with few techniques and adopt it to be inside for the indoors. Now for this algorithm or for this uh, proposed technique, we start with the proposing the dynamic cell and the static cell. The static cell, obviously the cell that people will, will be the destination of people or people spend their own time in it. For example, um, it's, it's a classroom, it's a something not as a, as a, as a, as a dynamic uh, cell or dynamic area where people go and come uh, as a corridor, for example. Uh, so based on this technique, what we basically do, the algorithm will start by determining or if someone wants to go a certain other rooms uh, and in the middle he wants to clock a certain room, the algorithm will start to give uh, to deter, to direct him through the dynamic room and not include static room in the way. Um, the dynamic room, in our perspective, is is the uh, the room that is is fine. It, it doesn't it, it's it's not violate the privacy of a user because it's a common area where people uh, can go and come from that area. Uh, so basically. We pre uh, the uh, the indoor user will prepare the path for the destination. Will determine a cell in the middle to be clocked, and then the result will will come. Now, uh, for example, here if, if a user A want to visit uh, to go from C I, uh, C -I until C Y, uh, and assuming that um, C E is the middle room which he want to to be clocked in the middle, then the algorithm basically starts by Retrieving now. Uh, now we know that the algorithm initially will start by determining the uh, first of all. He will uh, the, the algorithm will determine the uh, the dynamic rooms uh, as as many as 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 it can, and even if it's longer than uh, than other alternative path. And now we in here if we use actually the A star algorithm, where it has been shown for our previous papers that it is more efficient than others. Now for the Retrieved for this case, if CI is the one need to be clocked, the algorithm basically will choose the adjacent dynamic room for that room, and this this actually a combination between diversity method and the clock method that has been used for outdoor in term of areas. Here we use it in term of cells rooms, and it will be uh, use it uh, where it will create a diversity of fake. Uh, Areas where the user can be located on it, and then the the uh, the fake um, the fake uh, clock baths will be presented to 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 uh, to others where it can protect the user uh, privacy. Here's for this example: the actual bath actually start from CI through CE until 
CY, which as you can see, the dynamic room is here more, uh, the, the pack or the diversity path will actually go until uh, it will go to uh, CDE, which is actually a dynamic room next to that room. So it will indicate that the uh, user did not visit that room and went through the corridor to his last destination. And and few other options as well in order to uh, uh, protect the privacy of the, of the user. Now, in the end, uh, I didn't mention it. In the end, of course, we will do the filtering uh, algorithm, which we already tested. It will retrieve uh, in the in the uh, in the server. It will retrieve the actual result uh, for the server. Now, uh, for the, uh, the the most important thing here is we we consider the cost of con construction cost for our synthetic uh, uh, simulation for this one. We actually used a few baths, uh, bath A, B, uh, one, two, three, four, which is um, for a for a building which you already we already did our simulation for in a previous paper. And the uh, as you can see, the cost co uh, construction cost is actually um, um, is is re reasonable, even though we have a different bath and it's uh, considered to be larger bath or, or longer bath, which means it's actually more than 15 cells in our buildings. And then we also did it for the shorter baths, which is around like six to eight uh, cells between the rooms, and it's still still performing reasonably uh, uh, in different scenarios. We also, uh, as I mentioned before, we tested the um, we tested the filtering uh, uh, the filtering algorithm. Is still again it, it retrieved the actual bath within a reasonable time. So based on it, we think the uh, the algorithm is uh, efficiently working. Uh, with the with the acceptable uh, type. Thank you very much. Is there any uh, question? All right. Thank you very much. So we have finished it and we come back at
Hello? Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Are you the child? Yes. Okay. The chairs. The second one is Vadim Lisitsa. Is I don't know if he is here. Vadim, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, okay. So you can open and the presentation. I'm talking with Vadim Lisitsa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah. It's me. Ah, I Looks see. like it's me. Okay. Ah, so uh, you uh, will. Uh, present your talk and uh, I will play a role of the chair, right? Yeah. Okay. However, uh, I, I would rather ask you if it's possible to switch the, the second and the third talk. I mean, the, the, the one by Okay. And then yeah. by Mikhail and me, and then I'll disappear. I have to disappear after the. Mm -hmm. So you would like to be the first, right? Yeah, the two okay. first talks will be mine. <laughs> okay. okay. The third one is Mikhail Novikov, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. So, uh, uh, am I understand correct that uh, my time? Uh, my name is Mikhail Noikov, and I'm the presenter. Uh, yeah, yeah, we know. Awesome. <laughs> Forty minutes. Uh, my new time is uh, ten o'clock. Yeah. Or at, at uh, uh, five o'clock. Yeah. Is it okay for you? Yes, of course. Great. Great. Thank you. So should I show my oops? One minute left. Yeah. Should I show my face? Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> And what would happen if I try to share the screen? Yes, yes, you can start, I think. Uh, there is a button. Uh -huh, okay. Uh, is it? Yes, I can you can see, see the presentation or? Yeah, 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 I can see. It's a full screen presentation, right? It is not a full screen. No. Set no. Screen, please. Ah. Okay, with me. So, okay, uh, probably we can start our se section, mini symposium. Uh, I don't remember which is exact name of our mini symposium, but we have four uh, presentation. Uh, uh, the first one. And the second one is Vadim Lisitsa. Speaker, speaker is Vadim Lisitsa. Uh, for each talk, we have uh, 20 minutes, including questions. So we can start. Vadim, please try to share your screen. Uh, 
Okay, now you can see the presentation, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. A cool screen. Okay. Yeah, nice. So uh, good. What it is? Good afternoon. I suspect everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm Vadim Lisitsa, and I'm uh, gonna give them my first presentation uh, in this workshop, and it's gonna be on uh, seismic modeling and uh, implement and use of uh, machine learning to uh, speed up seismic modeling. Uh, uh, you can see my co-authors here. Uh, we are all from Institute of Mathematics and Geology and Geophysics. And what? It doesn't. Yeah. So uh, let me start with uh, with the main idea of what uh, the uh, numerical dispersion mitigation net network uh, is. Uh, we presented it last year, and uh, I'll just briefly remind you what it is. So uh, the idea is the following: We would like to speed up uh, seismic modeling by using machine learning. And the problem here is that we, if we need uh, high quality seismic data to be simulated, we need to use a very fine mesh to get all the peculiarities of the model and to get all the peculiarities of the wave field. Even uh, the the second, even more important than just uh, resolve the model. Because the model is typically given, uh, is provided to us on relatively coarse mesh, and uh, the grid size, which is used in simulations, is, is defined by the uh, by the wave field, not the model itself, mainly. And uh, of course, if we use very fine mesh, we get we can get uh, extremely nice results, but uh, it's going to take us forever. And, uh, if we use coarse mesh, we'll get uh, quite inaccurate, inaccurate results which will be quite close to reality, but uh, polluted with uh, high numerical distortion. And the idea of the NDM net is to uh, use machine learning to correct, not to compute the seismogram from, from the scratch, but to correct uh, seismograms which were computed by uh, using a coarse mesh and to, 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 to clean up the numerical dispersion from this data. Uh, this is an example of what is going on if we are using uh, different meshes. Uh, fine mesh on the left, then uh, coarse mesh, and then the difference between them and, uh, and all of them are presented in the same scale. Scaling, uh, so uh, you see that uh, the difference is uh, up to 100%, which is not that nice. And, uh, what, uh, and now the idea. Uh, the seismic data, if we simulate the seismic data, we need to solve the, uh, a lot of problems with the different right-hand sides, which uh, are defined by this source position. And the sources are placed quite dense at the, the free surface. And that uh, that means that we can probably try to use uh, quite a, a small number of sources to compute the uh, uh, training data set uh, using very fine mesh. So for the black, triangles here, we, we, we pick the black triangles here, the, the position of the sources, and uh, compute very fine, a very accurate solution uh, for these particular sources. Then we, uh, what we do, we compute coarse uh, solution using coarse mesh for all the sources, including these black guys, and also the red guys. And then we use the, the uh, fine mesh solution as the training data set and train the, 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 the network to map a coarse mesh solution for black guys to the fine uh, mesh solution for the black guys. And that's how we train it. And then we apply it to, to, to correct the, data, the, the entire data. That's pretty much uh, the idea of the uh, NDM net. And uh, the, the thing here that we can construct the training that the data set, not artificially, but from the, uh, the part of the entire data, the data set, which we need to, 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 to simulate. That's the main thing. And that's uh, an example, to the example, uh, that's a model, that's the uh, one of the traces uh, recorded by some receiver. And uh, at the top, you see the, the, the uh, application of NDM net uh, by, uh, to, to map five, five meter data, the, the data computed using five meter mesh to the data computed on a two meter, me, uh, meter mesh. And uh, this is a blue guy. The, the corrected guy and the black guy the uh, fine mesh solution so it's pretty nice for the uh, mapping of solution 10 to 2 meters it's not that good but there are some extra uh, difficulties in there nevertheless so and uh, 
Anyway, after that, we will compute uh, normalized root mean square, uh, difference between the seismograms and uh, estimated it, and uh, see that uh, the difference indeed gets uh, smaller than we applied uh, in the MNET. And uh, then we uh, estimated the speed up for this particular uh, example. And what we see, uh, if we would like to simulate fine mesh solution, it would take us about a day. If we compute a coarse mesh solution uh, and then uh, that they, you use 10% of the uh, source positions to compute uh, training data set and then training uh, at, at the training day, training time, time there and all the all, all, all the time we we need to uh, to enhance our uh, our uh, our wave field, we will finally get uh, the time estimate of about six hours. So if if even if we use this uh, concept uh, with very naive in very naive way, uh, if we do not try to optimize the position of the sources to construct the training data data set, we'll still have. Uh, quite a nice speed up of up to four times. But now uh, what we decided to do, we decided to see if we can uh, optimize the uh, training da data set to reduce the number of the uh, source positions uh, in the training data set to, uh, to reduce the computational time. Because if you, if you just take a look at this representation, then generation of the training da data set takes approximately the same time, took us approximately the same time as the, uh, simulation of, of the entire data set using coarse mesh and uh, that's why uh, it's quite important important to uh, reduce the number of the of the uh, reduce the training that data set and see what would happen so uh, what uh, we started with uh, we decided to see uh, so the, the the first idea of the the main idea of the MDM net uh, was uh, that we can use a uh, small number of, of sources to, to construct the, the training data set because uh, sources are, are so densely, uh, so, so closely super, uh, closely uh, situated at the, at the, at the uh, free surface uh, that the seismograms for two neighboring sources are quite similar to each other. So we, we the similarity of the seismograms for for two near in, nearby sources is the main idea why we can take just a few number just a several sources uh, to to construct the training that data set and have a representative uh, representative uh, data set and the what we first what we we, we looked at we computed the distance matrix and we compute an RMS between uh, just each by, we, we compared, we, we considered all the uh, entire data set and then compared the uh, seismograms, uh, each pair of seismograms, for, for each pair of seismograms, we computed the distance between them, the NRMS distance between them. And that's how the distance matrix looks like. Uh, of course, the, 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 the the diagonal is zero, and then uh, something uh, the, the the distance between the seismograms is extremely small uh, near the main di diagonal of the matrix, and then we see some very specific behavior of the distance uh, of the distance between the seismograms uh, if we uh, increase the, the the physical distance between the sources, and uh, you see that when we've got uh, vertical intrusions over here, the, this uh, causes uh, strong increase in the uh, in RMS difference between the in the in RMS between the seismograms. This uh, definitely uh, makes the, mo the model more complex. Anyway, so uh, this new plot over here is the uh, just uh, plot just two 2D plot representation of, of several uh, of several uh, rows of this distance matrix, and you see that. Of course, if we have a source down here, you can see them the, the pointer in my on my screen. Yes. Oh, great. So, okay, if we just take a look at here at the, the uh, source number six hundred, uh, we see that the distance is 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 is, close, is equal to zero for for the same. Uh, if we compare it with, with with itself, of course, and then it it, it increases almost linearly 
uh, up to uh, about 20 to 50 source positions. And then uh, it, it reaches something like some limiting value and uh, never never goes much higher or much lower than this uh, than the, than this uh, value, which is about uh, 110 percent. That's the limiting value of, of the NRMS between the seismograms. So for for it means that the seismograms are completely different. But if we go close to the to the uh, particular source position. We see that uh, the distance behaves quite quite smoothly and they almost linearly uh, increasing uh, almost linearly if we go out, out of the source position, and that's that was the the, the main uh, assumption which we used uh, to construct uh, NDMnet, and then we just uh, try try to study it in more details. So and uh, after that, what we uh, what we uh, take to took a look at. We considered uh, we introduced the uh, uh, the distance between the uh, between the uh, training data set and the uh, entire data set, and this distance uh, means uh, that the, it is a mark. Uh, oh, it's, it's minimum. Okay, it's distance between the uh, between what. Ah, okay. Uh, so first, what we what we took uh, uh, looked at, we considered the uh, just some uh, data set which uh, may take. Uh, we, we considered three of them. Uh, one of them contained only five percent of the entire data set, or five percent of the sources from the entire data set. The second one, ten percent, and then twenty percent of the uh, sources from the entire data set. And we uh, introduced the measure, the minimum of the uh, NRMS between the of all uh, between the particular uh, seismogram for the particular source from the entire data set and the minimum from the all the uh, so from uh, to the data the like it's 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 a distance di minimal distance from from uh, from any source to the uh, all sources uh, to the all sources from the tra training that data set. That's uh, what this formula means, and we uh, and that's what we represent on on the plot on on the bottom. So uh, of course the the the, the finer the 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 the, uh, the denser the uh, training data set, the, the 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 smaller will be the uh, the distance from this data set to 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 any to any source uh, from the from the entire data set. Uh, and, but you see that it's completely it, it, it varies uh, from from it, it strongly depends on the on the source position in for for this particular model, which is not that good idea. But why why should we use quite a, a dense uh, quite dense uh, training data set on the on the right hand side of the model where the NRMS is is extremely small for 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 the particular uh, number of sources oops i should pretty much finish so and then we uh, decided to use the another another measure which uh, we uh, we, we we took the maximum of all uh, of all uh, we took the maximum of the distance from the uh, from 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 any source position for, for from the seismogram for any source position to the seismogram to to all possible uh, Sources from the training that data set, so that's min max problem, and uh, and we try to to to, to, to construct the, the training data set to minimize this uh, uh, to, to 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 preserve the the, the entire the, the particular uh, level of this uh, distance, and that's what it looks like. So we we took uh, this uh, we we allow the distance from from the uh, from the entire data set to the training data set do not exceed 60, 60%, 80%, and 100%. And you see that the, 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 the higher the uh, allowed uh, distance, the, the, the course of the training da data set. And then we compare, we, we, we took a look at what, what, on what would happen if we consider different da data sets with different uh, uh, maximum distance, uh, varying it from 60 to 100%. And uh, you see that the uh, 
uh, number of, of, of sources in the, in the training that the data set decreases uh, significantly in this case, but the NRMS uh, computed for, for the uh, fi between the fine mesh and the predicted solution, which is uh, third column of, the, of this uh, table, uh, improves quite Quite, uh, quite quite slightly. So the, the the optimal choice would be like 70 to or 80 percent uh, distance between the, the seismograms, which gives us 56 or 100 uh, or 100 sources in, in, in the training data set instead of uh, almost 200 as as what we had before. Uh, so. The, the, this means that we reduce the number of the sources in the training data set by the factor of two or even a factor of, of four. Uh, and uh, we applied the same idea to, to, to the BP model. And that's how the NRMS distance matrix looks like. And that's how the, uh, that's the table representing the, uh, the possible uh, equidistantly distributed uh, training data sets containing two, five, tens, and 20% of the entire uh, data, the entire number of sources, and the NRMS between the uh, fine mesh solution and the predicted data. And you see that it, it is improving, but uh, we will get to pay quite a lot for that. Uh, using like 500 sources uh, as a training data set, which is not that good. Then we applied the idea which uh, I described before. We, we try to keep the distance between the uh, entire data set and then the training data set uh, below predicted level. And uh, you see that we can get uh, the, uh, the error of, uh, uh, so using like uh, 90 uh, sources, we can get the uh, about 41% uh, of the NRMS between the fine mesh solution and the predicted solution, which uh, com which is comparable with what we had uh, for for what? Oops. Yeah, the same. Uh, the same. So, okay. Uh, this is comparable with the 100. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, the, 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 uh, I, I forgot to change the, the, the second table. So, anyway, the, the plots here, they represent the uh, NRMS between the, so it's, it, it represents the different the, the dependence of, of the error between the uh, fine mesh solution and the uh, corrected solution as, uh, as, uh, as a as function of, of the number of sources used to construct the training dat data set. And the red one is uh, naive. Uh, strategy and the blue one is our strategy and you see that we can get much smaller and a much smaller error uh, for the same number of sources or, or vice versa we can get uh, we can use we can get the same the same uh, the same error using much smaller number of uh, sources in the training data set uh, and this uh, reduction is by the factor of four at least uh, which is quite nice, so we can uh, reduce the uh, entire the, the, the computational time by additional factor of two at least. So uh, that's the conclusions, and uh, thank you for your attention. Oops, I've got only one minute left, so okay. feel free to ask a short question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any questions? No questions. It was uh, so clear. Yes, m m maybe uh, it's not so clear, but <laughs> it's difficult to ask something. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, okay. Thank you, Vadim, for uh, your nice talk. The second speaker is uh, identical to the first one. <laughs> Vadim, please, your second talk. Uh, so again, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> uh, the next talk is going to be not about machine learning at all, but it's going to be about uh, uh, digital rock physics or some similar, similarly uh, related topic. Uh, so what we try to study, we try to study the effect of the uh, interface roughness on the uh, 
elastic model of the of the uh, entire. So if we if, okay, let me let me show the picture. It is going to be much easier. So the 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 idea of, of the research is to see if we can get uh, if we can uh, estimate the uh, interface roughness of the layered media uh, if we have a if we have an estimate of the um, elastic moduli of the entire model or which is more important for us if we can reconstruct if we can substitute the model uh, which ha which had a rough interfaces by the model with a flat interfaces but uh, with uh, uncertain uh, with uncertainty in the uh, model parameters of the of the uh, layers uh, the the idea of the of the research uh, is that if it, it if we try to to do some numerical simulations so like wave uh, wave propagation or estimation of the elastic moduli or something like that, it's extremely difficult to uh, to resolve the problem with rough interfaces because we need uh, to use a very fine mesh to describe the uh, the interfaces. On the other hand, if we uh, if we can substitute it with the flat interfaces, we can use extremely coarse mesh. But uh, use uh, uncertain, but, but introduce uncertainties in the uh, elastic moduli, which are easy to 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 take into account, and that's uh, what we try to do in this research. And uh, we did it. Uh, we did our research purely numerically. Uh, what we what we did, we we considered the model, which is represented on the left, with uh, which had uh, only two interfaces. Uh, which were uh, defined as the, the uh, flat interfaces with, with, with constant mean, but uh, with, uh, with statistical perturbation. And this uh, perturbation uh, was supposed to be a Gaussian random field with a given uh, standard deviation and the correlation uh, radius. Uh, uh, that's the starting model. The uh, model which we would like to finish with is the model with the flat interfaces, but the the black guy is supposed to be uh, uncertain. We 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 can with with some given uh, mean as, as a tensor and some given uh, covariance, and we try to 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 understand the 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 uh, relation between the uh, covariance of the of our stiffness tensor and the uh, roughness of the interface, the, the perturbation of the interface. Uh, okay, let me uh, proceed further. So uh, the idea is the following. We, we consider the, the model with rough interfaces. We, we, uh, it's, it's not that big. We uh, can use uh, almost arbitrary fine mesh to resolve it. And, to, uh, and after that, we uh, do numerical simulation of static loading uh, and estimate the stiffness tensor for the uh, for the uh, entire model. It's like homogenization. But this, uh, of course, this guy will be uh, certain for for particular statistical realization of, of the uh, of the model. But we consider the ten really. We, we further, I, I will say, I will describe the the models in more details. But uh, anyway, we we fixed the uh, standard deviation. We fixed the uh, co correlation length, and then we uh, we generated several realizations of the model. And for each realization, we can do upscaling, and then we will get the uh, statistically uh, like statistically varying uh, upscaled uh, model for for the entire domain. After that, we we would like to 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 to, to go back to the model with to, 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 to the model with the flat interfaces. So we need to apply the to invert the Schoenberg uh, uh, homogenization relations to uh, reconstruct the uh, stiffness tensor for the for this black guy. The the white guys in, in the model on the, on the left and on the right are supposed to be the same. But what what is varying is the uh, black guy and the and its interface. So let us now take a look on what is going on with the uh, mean value of the uh, estimated stiffness tensor and the covariance matrix. Uh, okay, uh, let me say a few words on the uh, on what the parameters were. 
the the the, the white guys were supposed to be the quartz grains and the, the parameters were fixed the black guy was uh, we considered it is a clay uh and what i did it's, it's uh shear modules and the uh bulk models or ratio of the uh, bulk to shear modules which is more convenient for us and also we were at the uh correlation lengths and the uh, uh, standard deviation as i told before and we uh, we measured it in in, in in terms of the uh mean uh, distance between the interfaces just for for simplicity so uh we considered the quadruplets of given correlation lengths given standard deviation given uh shear modules and given ratio of bulk to shear modules and for each uh, quadruplet we simulated 10 uh, statistical realizations of the uh, of the model to to do uh, the simulations and of course uh, first thing we uh, that we uh, checked is that uh, if we go back if we start with the model with a given uh, mean uh, distance between the interfaces and we would like to finish up with the model with the same distance between the flat interfaces and then and we would like to estimate the uh, efficient effective stiffness tensor this stiffness tensor is going to be just the same as the one uh, for the for, for the clay and uh, we checked it uh, using Royson test and stuff like this and then we uh, can say that uh, it's, it's 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 indeed so uh, and the main thing we, which we, we need to focus on is the uh, covariance matrix because it allows us to, to then to, to, to simulate the uh, the statistically perturbed stiffness tensor for the black guy over here uh, okay so uh, it was as I, as I told before, we, 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 we use different model parameters, which are shear, shear modules and the ratio of bulk to shear modules, and two uh, parameters which defines the, uh, the interface of roughness itself. And uh, first, we, what we did, we considered uh, them separ quite separately. So we fixed, uh, for, for, for instance, at the first stage, uh, we, fi yeah, we fixed the uh, model parameters and then varied the uh, statistical parameters of the, of the interface to see what is going on in there. And uh, why we did it? Because uh, the, the idea here that if we if we make compute if we, we computed this uh, uh, the um, the stiffness tensor and covariance matrix for the stiffness tensor for uh, this particular uh, okay what it is it's, it's five and four it for, for 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 20 values for 20 uh, po possible combinations of, of correlation lengths and the uh, standard deviation then we uh, we would like to be able to uh, reconstruct the uh, covariance matrix uh, for the uh, other values of these two parameters if it's possible or not for 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 the fixed uh, model parameters and uh, it's possible it, to do so, we need to, to do a matrix interpolation, which can be written like this. And the uh, covariance matrix is uh, positive definite. And uh, thus, we can apply uh, this very simple and nice formula to interpolate two matrices, sigma 1 and sigma 2, uh, to get the particular value of the, of the matrix. And if we, and uh, now let us take a look at on what is going on with the log, uh, logarithms of the covariance matrices uh, corresponding to different values. And uh, okay, what is it? Yeah, first we uh, we fixed uh, we fixed uh, shear modulus, bulk to shear modulus, and uh, standard deviation, and just varied correlation lengths. And uh, we observed that uh, the logarithm of the covariance matrix uh, linearly depends uh, on uh, the logarithm of the uh, of, uh, standard deviation. Uh, and the the error between the uh, linear uh, linear trend and the uh, and the experimental data uh, was not that high so it's it's pretty much linear and can be uh, quite nicely approximated linearly with respect to the correlation lengths pretty much the same results we obtained for the uh, we obtained for the uh, standard deviation so uh, if we if we are talking about 
the dependence of the uh, covariance matrix on the parameters or on the roughness of the interface they depends pretty much linearly on the uh, on these parameters it's quite quite nicely quite nice so we we can apply the uh, multilinear bilinear uh, regression to estimate what is going on with the logarithm of the uh, covariance or uh, yeah, logarithm of the covariance matrix of the stiffness standard uh, with respect to the uh, standard deviation and uh, correlation lines. The situation is not that nice if we are talking about the dependence on the uh, on the model parameters, on the shear models and the uh, bulk to shear models. In this case, the dependence is quite, is quite complex and uh, all we can do... So, for the previous parameters, we, we, we can apply the linear regression and, and find the point, find the value and wherever we are on the on, the, on this entire 2D plane of, of the uh, standard deviation correlation. For the uh, model parameters, uh, all we can do, we can use uh, linear or any other interpolation uh, in between the uh, given points. So if we know that we computed, uh, if, we, if we need to compute the solution for, for some uh, for some uh, shear models and bulk to shear models, we need to take the four nearest points where we, we know the values and then uh, use bilinear interpolation just to reconstruct the, the covariance matrix. That's the only, the, the, that's all we can, we can do about it. But for the, uh, as, as I told, for the uh, standard deviation and correlation lengths, it's it, dependence is pretty much linear and it's, we, we can reconstruct it wherever we want and we can just use use uh, like four parameters to, to parameterize this oh three parameters to parameterize this, this plane of course uh, okay so uh, and then we try to to after after all these considerations we, we try to uh, verify our our algorithm and the uh, we, we took uh, 18 absolutely random uh, values of these uh, four parameters, not uh, coinciding with what we considered before, and computed the uh, uh, computed 10 realizations of the models for each uh, set of parameters, and then uh, estimated the uh, stiffness tensor and its its correlation matrix or covariance matrix, and then. Uh, compared it with uh, with our predictions based on the linear regression for the uh, standard deviation and, and covariant correlation lengths and the bilinear interpolation with respect to the model parameters, and that's uh, how the uh, error looks like. The uh, the color represents the the error value. The the, the blue supposed to be small. The the, the orange supposed to be high, and uh, as high as as what. What is the color bar over here? Nice. So it's supposed to be as high as uh, 0 0.3, right? And uh, the it's uh, it's represented in the plane of, of the standard devi deviation and correlation lengths. And uh, so the, the higher the, the standard deviation, the higher the error, which is quite a predictable thing. Uh, okay, that's pretty much it. So the uh, what we presented, we presented uh, the uh, the approach how to map the uncertainty of the uh, interfaces in the model, which which are in the model, to the uncertainties of the uh, stiffness tensor, and how we can uh, use already computed data, which we well, which we pre-computed already, and we can upload it to. Uh, to to a cloud, and then we can we can someone just can take the, these values and use our formula, and then uh, estimate the uh, uncertainty in the stiffness tensor for for their particular model parameters, and uh, it can be done to to uh, improve the seismic modeling and to improve the estimation of the uh, stiffness tensor for the uh, if we are talking about. Uh, Digital core samples uh, and digital digital physics to 
used for for the estimation of the elastic model of the of the, of the core samples. That's pretty much it. Thank you for your attention. Now I've got okay. five minutes, but I, I'm afraid that there will be no more questions than before. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay. I would like to ask something. Uh, what is uh, the physical uh, the physical reason for uh, uh, influence of roughness on elastic model moduli is it uh, interfacial friction or what uh, well uh, in this particular simulation in this particular uh, like setup uh, it's not the uh, friction it's it's just uh, Variability of the uh, layer thickness. I see. The 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 the, 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 the thicker the layer, the the the, the weaker the, the 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 entire model will be. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, the, of course, if we have got more rough interface, uh, the 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 the, uh, the properties are gonna change more rapidly. Mm -hmm. Okay, and. What is the difference between ideal layered structure and rough uh, uh, difference in uh, value of elastic model? In so percents? The, the mean value is going to be just the same. If mm. we if we are talking about the same mean uh, thickness of the of the layer. The mean value of the stiffness tensor is going to be just the same. It's well, it's expected. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if we are talking about uh, rough interface, it's it's gonna give us uncertainty in the, in the stiffness tensor. Mm -hmm. uh, for for the flat interface, if, if if the model had already had the flat interface, there will will be no uncertainty due to the this concept. I mean, if we know all the parameters in each layer and the absolutely ideal uh, flat interface, the uh, we can get. Uh, unique value of the uh, of the effective moduli. If we have a roughness, we will we'll have a estimation of the effective moduli with some uncertainty, and this uncertainty should be taken into account, or at least be kept in mind if we are talking about estimation of the elastic property of the core samples. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. More questions? No, so thank you, Abadim, for interesting talk. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I need to stop sharing, right? Right, right. So the next speaker is Mikhail Novikov. Mikhail, please share your screen. Good afternoon, colleagues. Can you see the screen? Not yet. And now we can see. Can you see the first slide uh, full screen? Yes, yes, yes. You Thank can you. start. Okay. Thank you. So uh, again, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, the title of my presentation is presented on the slide. It's uh, about numerical solution of uh, anisotropic bio equations in quasi-static state. Here's my uh, co-authors. Uh, and I'm uh, today a presenter. Uh, some uh, industrial applications, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, quite prospective uh, uh, carbon dioxide sequestration and uh, um, geothermal energy production, uh, <clears throat> challenges uh, us uh, with uh, a need of uh, quite good uh, seismic monitoring. Uh, uh, and one promising uh, characteristic uh, in seismic, uh, which is uh, studied recently, is uh, seismic attenuation. Uh, uh, recent studies uh, in the last 10 years showed that uh, there are uh, several uh, dominant mechanisms of uh, seismic attenuation in uh, fractured uh, fluid saturated porous media 
Uh, and uh, one of the most interesting mechanisms uh, is uh, wave-induced, uh, so-called wave-induced fluid flow, uh, which uh, is usually divided into types, uh, fluid flow between uh, the background rock and fractures, and uh, also the fluid flow between the connected fractures. Uh, each type uh, depends on its own uh, uh, characteristics and properties of the media and uh, has uh, its own uh, characteristic frequency. So uh, as a perspective, uh, the frequency dependent uh, seism seismic attenuation estimation can serve uh, as a indicator as an indicator of uh, fluid mobility in the reservoir uh, or uh, the fracture formation transport properties. Uh, on the other hand, uh, modern uh, laboratory and uh, numerical experiments uh, allow us to uh, consider quite detailed uh, uh, models of material uh, in micro scale, uh, as well as uh, obtain some information uh, and consider uh, more detailed uh, mesoscale scale models uh, and uh, modern algorithms of uh, uh, discrete fr uh, fracture network uh, creation uh, uh, allow us to consider the uh, models of uh, connected fractures, uh, which is uh, quite good because uh, in real uh, fractured media, uh, most of fluid mobility is provided by uh, chains of connected fractures. And it's important to uh, obtain uh, representative dependencies uh, of uh, seismic attenuation on uh, some properties like uh, fracture connectivity or micro scale uh, anisotropy of the media. So uh, it, uh, it it all challenges us with the creation of uh, effective uh, algorithms uh, to obtain a representative attenuation estimations. So uh, our our algorithm of uh, seismic attenuation estimation is based on the upscaling problem. Uh, by upscaling, uh, we uh, uh, mean uh, the uh, recovery of uh, reconstruction of uh, some equivalent uh, uh, viscoelastic media uh, equivalent to given a poroelastic media. Uh, by, uh, by equivalent, we mean that uh, if we uh, uh, if we uh, set uh, the same boundary uh, loadings on two samples of uh, poroelastic media and equivalent uh, viscoelastic media, which is unknown, we uh, should get the same uh, response from them. Uh, For given uh, gi given uh, poroelastic uh, media uh, with fluid in it uh, is described by a, a well-known uh, bio model and described with uh, in particular uh, in our uh, case is described by uh, anisotropic uh, bio equations in quasi-static state, which is presented on the slide. Here's the first uh, four uh, equations forming a system and. Uh, uh, serve to find the unknown uh, displacement components of the solid phase and uh, relative displacement components of, of the uh, fluid phase in material. And also uh, after we find uh, displacements, we can uh, find the st stress tensor, uh, which is uh, formulated in the terms of uh, displacements in this uh, generalized kind of uh, hook flow. Uh, from the other side, uh, unknown uh, viscoelastic media uh, is described uh, by the equations of viscoelasticity, which is uh, fully uh, defined by uh, effective uh, complex valid uh, stiffness tensor, uh, which we need to find. And uh, here's also uh, a well-known uh, relation between uh, stresses and uh, strains is usual uh, hook flow with uh, complex valid stiffness tensor. So uh, saying that uh, and uh, remembering the condition uh, which we said of equality of uh, response on the same loadings at the boundaries of uh, two samples, 
uh, we obtain uh, the uh, equations we which uh, uh, equations um, involving uh, average uh, stress values in one and uh, an, another uh, one uh, media medium and so from the one test of uh, same loading of those two samples we can uh, obtain uh, the three equations on the this unknown uh, where is uh, where the uh, stiffness tensor components are unknown uh, but uh, in general we have uh, nine components of stiffness tensor so uh, this system is uh, obviously underdetermined and we need to determine it uh, by uh, another six equations uh, which uh, we get from another two tests of loading uh, the choose uh, of uh, three loading tests uh, is non-unique. So for the simplicity, we uh, consider three uh, simple for understanding uh, loading tests uh, and for representation. Uh, it's two uh, unexial, uh, unexial normal loading uh, uh, tests along two axes, uh, the, the first two uh, uh, tests. And the third one is a share loading test. From each uh, uh, experiment, we uh, they are presented uh, they are presented the boundary uh, conditions uh, for the stresses on boundaries, and from each test we obtain three equations uh, with unknown uh, stiffness, viscoelastic stiffness tensor com uh, tensor components, and in total we obtain nine equations for nine unknown components uh, shown on this slide. Uh, and finally, uh, knowing the stiffness tensor, we uh, can say that we reconstructed the uh, equivalent viscoelastic media. And from this information, we can uh, obtain by these formulas uh, estimations uh, for phase velocities uh, for two P waves in direction of the axis and uh, shear wave, uh, as well as the value of quality factor uh, for uh, this way, uh, waves, uh, which is invert, and if we invert the quality factor values, we obtain uh, the relative wave amplitude decrease uh, over a wave cycle, which is uh, simply can be considered as attenuation. Uh, so uh, the differential uh, equations uh, discretize, discretize uh, at the staggered uh, grid and the computational domain is approximated by a staggered uh, so-called staggered grid which means that uh, we have a uh, computational grid with uh, several sets of nodes uh, and different uh, components of the solution uh, and different uh, derivatives and equations are presented in different nodes as uh, shown uh, on the uh, right picture at the slide um, uh, all derivatives uh, are approximated with uh, central differences uh, uh, with the second order. Uh, so uh, if we discretize uh, the differential uh, problem, uh, we finally obtain the uh, system of linear equations. And for three tests, we obtain uh, correspondingly three uh, systems of equations with a uh, matrix uh, which is uh, complex uh, and symmetric uh, have incomplete rank and also sparse uh, but uh, good thing is that for all frequencies uh, that we consider it uh, has the same pattern but uh, with all these properties, uh, solving the system uh, with this uh, matrix, with, uh, for example, some indirect solvers is quite challenging. Uh, and uh, so we use uh, the direct solver, uh, Intel MKL uh, PADISA, to solve these uh, systems. Uh, here uh, we can see the table presenting uh, computational times for uh, 21 frequencies uh, uh, and we have the three tests for each frequency and computations uh, were performed uh, using the 20 cores uh, of processor Intel Xeon 
and uh, we can see that uh, total time of computations for quite a big uh, computa computational grid, which is uh, uh, quite representative for uh, even uh, very detailed, detailed enough uh, fractured uh, samples, the time is uh, quite uh, small and adequate. Uh, so the last part of the presentation is numerical uh, results uh, obtained by the presented algorithm. Uh, we have performed uh, three uh, sets of experiments in total. First uh, experiments were performed uh, to verify our algorithm. And uh, here we consider the uh, quite simple layered media with uh, two materials forming the layers of the same thickness as shown in the slide. Uh, and um, uh, in this case, we uh, can um, compare uh, the obtained numerical uh, estimation shown uh, at the two figures for uh, velocity and uh, inverse quality factor by a red line. We can comp compare it with a uh, dashed line presenting analytical estimation um, of uh, these values. and. Uh, as a result, we can see a good agreement uh, with uh, relative errors about uh, percents, as you can see. Uh, so the second set of experiments is uh, aimed to uh, investigate the effect of fracture connectivity on the seismic attenuation. And to do so, we consider uh, fractured models with different uh, connectivity degree. By connectivity degree, I mean uh, the different uh, average uh, length of uh, connected uh, fracture chains. And we can call it uh, the percolation length. Uh, so here we can see six samples uh, with different uh, connectivity degree from black to red, from left to right, from top to bottom. Here we can see the increasing of uh, average uh, uh, fracture chain length, providing uh, in, in as we expect in, uh, that uh, it will be pro provide uh, it, it will provide the more intense uh, fracture to fracture fluid flow and we uh, hopefully hopefully can see it uh, uh, on the estimations so uh, this slide we can see the obtained uh, attenuation uh, estimations uh, uh, colors correspond to the connectivity degrees uh, in particular, from uh, black to uh, from black to red, uh, we uh, from black to red the connectivity is increasing, and uh, uh, we can see two uh, attenuation peaks clearly. Uh, the first peak, uh, the low frequency one, uh, is corresponding to a fracture to background uh, wave induced fluid flow attenuation, and we can see that with uh, uh, with uh, connectivity increase, uh, its uh, uh, amplitude is decreasing. And as expected, uh, for the second uh, high frequency peak, which is corresponding to fracture to fracture wave induced fluid flow, we can see the uh, increase of its amplitude. So, the main thing there is uh, we can uh, clearly see significant change in uh, attenuation trend. Uh, with uh, the change of uh, fracture connectivity. I need to note that uh, in all models, the um, concentration of fractures were the same. Uh, and the last uh, set of uh, experiments uh, were aimed to uh, investigate the effect of uh, microscale anisotropy on the seismic attenuation. Can we see the change, uh, the significant change in uh, attenuation? if we uh, involve uh, anisotropy of uh, fluid field uh, material. Uh, in particular, uh, we consider such anisotropic material that is uh, more permeable and uh, has uh, smaller elastic moduli along the fractures. Uh, and uh, correspondingly, uh, are less uh, permeable and uh, have uh, bigger uh, elastic moduli across the fractures. So uh, also to compare uh, results, we consider uh, two uh, isotropic materials 
which is a kind of uh, limited cases for the anisotropic one. Uh, one of materials is uh, quite soft, meaning that it is uh, very high permeable and uh, has a smaller, uh, quite smaller uh, elastic moduli. And the second material is uh, stiff. Uh, it's almost uh, non-permeable and expecting to give almost no uh, fluid flow between the fractures, uh, which we can uh, see on this slide. So here uh, we present the estimations of attenuation for three uh, considered uh, fluid field materials uh, by the solid uh, black line we uh, show uh, we present the re results for anisotropic material and the dashed and uh, dot dashed uh, lines uh, are corresponding uh, to uh, soft material and stiff material corresponding. Um, so when we have almost no uh, permeability uh, within the fractures, uh, as shown, as presented by a uh, dash dotted uh, line, <clears throat> we uh, see only one attenuation peak, uh, which is obviously associated with uh, only fractured background uh, fluid flow, as there is no uh, fluid flow within the connected fractures. Uh, so uh, as opposite uh, for soft material, we can clearly see two peaks. And uh, as we uh, consider the most connected uh, model of all considered before, we can clearly see two peaks uh, correspond to two uh, wave-induced fluid flow mechanisms. And uh, the most important result is uh, that uh, we can clearly see the difference between the results for anisotropic materials and anisotropic ones. And uh, anisotropy can uh, be noted in the uh, seismic attenuation estimated in perspective. So the conclusion uh, is on the slide. And uh, plans for the future is the uh, next one. We plan uh, to extend our algorithm as it is uh, 2D now to 3D case. Uh, and uh, it also can involve the parallelization, uh, maybe with uh, involving the GPU instead of uh, CPU. and. Uh, also, as um, the at relatively high frequencies, uh, we uh, uh, expect the dominance of uh, some dynamics effect in attenuation. We uh, should consider both uh, quasi-static and dynamic approach to uh, form to construct the quite uh, wide range in frequency uh, seismic attenuation estimation. Uh, also, we want to apply alternative uh, models for pluralistic media, maybe more uh, advantaged ones. And the, uh, we expect further study of uh, fractures, uh, fractured media structure and physical properties influence on seismic attenuation. So thank you for your attention. I hope there is time for some questions. Yes, we have one minute for questions. Does anybody want to ask something? Probably nobody. Okay, so I thank you, Mikhail, for your nice talk. We uh, uh, continue our mini symposium. Now the last talk, the speaker is me. So, where is my presentation? Sorry, did I stop the demonstration of my screen or not? I can't. Uh, yes, I don't see your uh, presentation. I now I uh, want to understand, understand how to switch on my screen. I press the button switch on screen. Uh -huh. Now I understand how it works. 
So I shall speak about a new computational model for fluid and elastic solid interaction, which is based on asymmetric hyperbolic thermodynamically compatible uh, systems theory. This is a joint work with my colleague Galina Reshetova from Institute of Computational. I don't see the presentation. Sorry? I don't see the presentation. Really? The in the screen. Why? Let's try again. Do you see now? No, yes. Okay, okay, good. So you can see. No. Uh, in full screen, no. Not? No. And now? Do you see now something? No. No? No. What is going on? In full screen the mode, uh, go out. Can you see it now? Yes. Now, yes. Okay. So, you see full uh, screen or not? It is not full screen for now. Uh, let's try. I Press control L. You see a full it screen? Disappeared. It disappeared. It disappeared. Okay. Yes. So let's try. Slide show, maybe. And now you can see or not? Uh, no. No. Okay. And now you can see. Unfortunately, not. Okay. <laughs> Strange. And now? No, yes. Okay. Let's uh, do uh, in this way. Okay. okay. Uh, I guess you can press the right uh, uh, arrow pointing to the right uh, near the scroll uh, stripe and uh, make a slide bigger. Mm -hmm. Let's try. And now you can okay. see. It's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So, control L uh, doesn't work. Okay. Okay. So uh, now a brief introduction. The solid fluid interaction is a complex uh, multi-physics problem of interest for different industrial applications and everyday life. One of the main challenges in modeling uh, this type of problems is the, the numerical treatment of the interface between a fluid and the deformable moving solid. The difficulty consists in the formulation of the boundary condition for a moving curvilinear interface and its numerical implementation. I would like to say that in the recent recent decades a diffuse interface approach has emerged that has a an advantage of being able to use a rectangular mesh which is very convenient for simulations. The main idea of this approach is to formulate a general multiphase model rather than to combine separate models for uh, fluid and solid through the boundary interaction. In this case, the interface is uh, taken into account as a jump in the volume fraction of the faces, and the interaction of faces is automatically described by the conservation laws of the general multiphase model. 
Such an approach is highly convenient for numerical implementation and high-performance numerical simulations. Our goal is to develop a computational model for multi-phase mixture, which is applicable for fluid-elastic solid interaction. The model uh, which we derived uh, uses the symmetric hyperbolic thermodynamically compatible system theory, which provides hyperbolicity of governing uh, partial, partial differential equations, in particular uh, symmetric hyperbolicity in the sense of Friedrichs. Uh, solutions of uh, the model satisfy thermodynamic laws. Uh, uh, it, it is a conservation of energy and entropy growth. And uh, the governing equations are Galilean invariance. All these properties allow us application of advanced higher order numerical methods which provide the reliability of numerical solution to uh, governing PDEs. Uh, I would like to know that many well-known equations of continuum mechanics be belongs, belong to the class of symmetric hyperbolic thermodynamically compatible systems. Here, uh, uh, examples are listed. Uh, this is gas dynamic equations, magnetohydrodynamics equations, uh, linear and non-linear elasticity equations, and so on. Uh, the uh, SHTC model which we propose for the uh, solid fluid mixture is based on the synthesis of the SHTC unified model of continuum as and SHTC model of a compressible multiphase flow. On this slide, you can see SHTC unified model of continuum, which consists of the uh, set of conservation laws. Uh, uh, this is momentum, mass conservation laws, and a distortion for uh, evolution equation for distortion, which uh, characterize uh, the, the, the deformation of a, a medium and also the entropy balance law. Uh, the additional energy conservation law holds, uh, that means uh, that the uh, system satisfies uh, the uh, thermodynamic laws. You can uh, compute all uh, thermodynamic forces, and I would like to know, uh, to know that in the equation for, for the distortion, there is a parameter uh, theta, which uh, describes the state of the medium. Uh, if uh, uh, relaxation, uh, shear relaxation time is infinity, th then we have elastic elasticity equation. And if tau is small, uh, the solution to the system are close to the uh, solution of Navier uh, Stokes equation. So the system describes all uh, states of the medium. Uh, uh, SHTC model of two-phase compressible flow uh, is presented on uh, this slide. Uh, we used this model for the simulation uh, of many problems of two-phase flow and uh, the synthesis of this model with uh, the unified model gives us a, a SHTC model of multi-phase solid fluid mixture, which is applicable to the uh, porous, saturated porous medium. And uh, it, it is also uh, can be applied for a uh, solid fluid uh, interaction problems. Uh, okay, so. Uh, uh, the very complex model of uh, presented on the uh, previous slide uh, can be applied uh, uh, for small amplitude wave propagation. Uh, I uh, can show uh, I can show you the uh, linear system which was derived from the. Uh, complex 
nonlinear model. Uh, it is a linear system uh, which uh, describes the uh, small amplitude wave propagation in saturated porous medium, but it is uh, it also also can be applied for uh, solid fluid for the description of small amplitude waves in the solid fluid mixture. For example, in a fluid with uh, elastic inclusions. A diffuse interface uh, means uh, that if uh, that uh, the boundary between fluid and solid is described by the jump in the volume fraction. If uh, the volume of fraction of fluid is equal to zero and uh, volume fraction of solid is equal to one, we can we obtain the uh, linear viscoelasticity equation and. Uh, Vice versa, if uh, uh, the volume fraction of a fluid is equal to one and volume fraction of elastic solid is equal to zero, we have uh, acoustic of viscous fluid with effective viscosity, which is uh, equal to a product of shear modulus uh, and shear relaxation time. Okay, now uh, I will show the application of diffuse interface method uh, in linear problem. It is small amplitude wave propagation in the fluid with solid inclusions. And uh, I will show one example of nonlinear problem. It is a fluid flow with the solid elastic inclusions. For uh, numerical experiments, of small amplitude wave propagation, uh, we use uh, uh, regular source for uh, generating wave field. In all uh, computations, we used a finite difference method on staggered grids, and uh, in for unbounded regions we used a perfectly matched layers method. Uh, the first example is a, a wave propagation in multi-layered medium. Uh, on this picture uh, we see simulation of a multi-layered medium. Uh, on the left picture, uh, you see uh, simulations uh, for some time moment. Uh, on the left, it is uh, the simulation was done with the use of our model, solid fluid. And on the right, we uh, see the result of simulation, which was done by a elastic model with boundary treatment. So each layer, for each layer, we, uh, we have to uh, use boundary conditions. And on the right, uh, we see a comparison of our simulation with a known from the liter literature exact solution. The agreement is uh, very good, so our model works well. Uh, this is an example uh, of a more complex uh, problem. Uh, it was uh, taken from the console library. Uh, here uh, we have a fluid with uh, solid inclusions. Uh, black it is a solid and white is a fluid. Uh, the wave uh, uh, was generated in uh, the red point. Here we see uh, the wave propagation in, in a fluid. Uh, the wave fields uh, were computed uh, with the use of single 
PDE system and uh, interface boundary is not required here. And he, here is uh, the same wave field, but is it is in elastic solid. Uh, I have to note again then that wave fields are simulated by the single PDA system and interface boundary treatment is not required. Okay, and uh, now uh, I will show the uh, uh, simulation for of nonlinear model for a single velocity for elastic solid fluid interaction. The governing equations are uh, consist of the uh, set of uh, conservation laws. This is a, a symmetric hyperbolic uh, thermodynamically compatible system and a diffuse interface approach was applied uh, to the following problem. It, it is a solid elastic ball sinking in a liquid. We uh, used a fifth order of accuracy in, in space and time uh, for simulation. It is a uh, fifth order uh, runga kata in time and fifth order of accuracy in weighted essentially non-linear, non-oscillating method, Vino method. Fifth order in space and time. And here you see, you can see uh, an application a diffu of diffuse interface. Uh, this is initial opposition of a solid ball. Uh, 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 under the gravity, uh, the ball is uh, sinking. Uh, this is uh, 1,000 time steps, and this is 2,000 time steps. So uh, it, you see that uh, the diffuse interface works well. Uh, the simulation was done by the single PDA system and the picture is very nice. So we, we will continue the research in this direction. So the conclusions are the following. A new computational SHTC model has been developed to simulate the interaction between a compressible fluid and elastic solid body. The governing equation of the model are well posed. They can be transformed to a symmetric hyperbolic system and existence and uniqueness of the solution is provided at least locally in time. And uh, the governing PDAs are thermodynamically correct. The first and second laws are satisfied. Uh, all these properties of the model ensure the reliability of the solution of the governing uh, equations which are obtained numerically. The diffuse interface method uh, which is used to simulate the, interface, the interaction of a fluid and elastic solid demonstrate the efficiency of the model. We plan to apply uh, the diffuse interface sharpening method such as uh, THINK uh, as well uh, to apply the proposed model to solve uh, different problems of the uh, solid fluid interaction and in particular to apply uh, the fluid flow in uh, elastically deformed uh, digital core. So thank you for your attention. Any thank questions? You. So let me switch off demonstration of screen. Uh, so uh, questions, no questions. So probably no questions. So let me let me finish the our mini symposium. Thank you to all participants for Thank interviewing. You.
Jokes? Okay, thank you. Okay, so goodbye. See you on the next conference. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.